Professor Whiteford, welcome to Capitol Hill. Thank you for having me. Could we start with, with some of the facts on especially the disability support pension? How many people are on it and have those numbers fallen or grown in recent years? Well, there are around 800,000 of the most... Uh, well, there were about 750,000 in 2009, which are the most recent available figures. Uh, I've seen some preliminary estimates. It's likely to go up to around 800,000. Uh, the numbers have been growing over the... Well, fairly fairly consistently since the early 1980s but they've been growing for different reasons at different times and also when you look at the numbers you have to take account of what happens in the rest of the social security system. For example, uh, since 1996 half the growth has actually got nothing to do with what disability was happening to disability in the community, but it's due to the ageing of the population. Uh, so in 1996, the baby boom generation, um, who were born in 1946, turned 50. And uh, your likelihood of receiving a disability pension is much higher if you're over 50 than if you're under 50. So, for example, um, only about 2% of people in, in their 20s are receiving a disability pension, but about 9% in, um, in, their, um, in their 50s. So the ageing of the population is actually having quite a strong effect on uh, the recent growth in disability pension. And as I said, in the last um, 15 years or so, it accounts for half of the, half of the increase. Uh, uh, has, there been a, has there been a change, too, in... in um, eligibility for the disability pension in what people are uh, claiming as a disability, for example, a change in, in maybe those who are on the disability support pension because of a mental illness? Um, there's not so much a change in eligibility for, for those reasons. Um, it, it's certainly true that uh, it appears as if um, mental health issues are an increasing concern in the community and there's a rise in some of those uh, problems, particularly amongst younger age groups. But what the important eligibility changes are, in, are in fact what's happened in other parts of the social security system. So that until 1995, um, women aged 60 to 64 were eligible for an age pension. And what happened after 1995 is that this was phased out. Um, so in 1996, for example, there were about 3,000 women aged 60 to 64 um, receiving a disability pension, but now there are about 70,000. So there, in fact, women aged 60 to 64 are the most rapidly growing group of disability pensioners. And... Uh, they are one of the major other contributors to the growth in numbers on disability pension. But in fact, what's happened when you look at the total level of welfare receipt amongst um, women in their early 60s, it's fallen dramatically. It's gone from about 68% uh, of women in that age group to 37% of women in that age group. So in fact, total welfare receipt um, amongst older people has virtually halved in the last 15 years. It's just that of the people who are still on welfare payments, um, now much more, many more of them are receiving disability payments. What, what sort of... So if we focus on... Sorry, continue. I just, if we focus only on disability payments, we're in danger of getting the, the, the wrong picture, I think. What sort of incentives or disincentives already exist in the system for getting people back into work? Um, the... the the incentives in the system in terms of the structure of benefits are reasonably good uh, in that um, you, can, you can have um, your pension is reduced by 50 cents in the dollar uh, for other income. So while that's a higher tax rate effectively than other people pay uh, on, on earnings, it means that if you work it still pays. I, I think the issue is more about uh, what happens to people in the early stages of disability, uh, whether their former employer, if they had one, has any responsibilities for um, uh, trying to keep them attached to the workforce and then the issue of what sort of training and retraining people need for uh, different, sorts of, um, different sorts of jobs. I, I think you know, there, are, there are multiple types of people experiencing disability, so it's not as if there's sort of one uh, answer for everybody. So, so say, for example, there, there are people who've had a disability for a long period of time, some of whom have, may have 
lived, worked in workplaces that have made adjustments. But then there are people who uh, may not have had a disability, they were employed, um, they lost their job uh, in an economic downturn, uh, and uh, after a year or two on unemployment benefits, um, it's very common for people to develop various sorts of health problems. So some people have pre-existing disabilities and they lose their jobs uh, for a range of reasons. Other people have disabilities that, uh, that have an onset after they lose their job. And I suppose the, the other issue is that, um, that the, the, as I said, there are a range of disabilities and they interact with people's skills and age. So. As I said, more than half of the people receiving disability pension are in their 50s or 60s. So in addition to having um, some problem with sickness or disability, they potentially have issues to do with age discrimination. And it also depends on the type of job they had uh, before they um, developed a disability. So if you were a manual worker who develops uh, some sort of disability, your likelihood of re being re-employed as a manual worker is much less than if you were uh, an office worker who, say, for example, um, has an accident. So, so uh, given, so, given so that, we... given that change in the makeup of people on disability support pension, and given the the discrimination older people may face in the workplace, does that make it harder for a government looking at changing the system to get more people back into work? Well, it, it, it's very difficult to say. Currently in Australia, about 40% um, of all people who have a disability of, and are aged between 20 and 65 um, are in paid work. Uh, quite a number of those are in, in part-time work. Now, the best performing countries in the rich world, the OECD countries, uh, about 60% is the best, actually. So uh, there's no rich country where more than 60% of people with disability have paid work. So we, we could certainly improve our circumstances, um, but I think we should see this as a you know, sort of... Um, well, more than incremental, uh, significant. Um, so, I, so I think we should aim for uh, increasing employment of people with disability because uh, basically I'd argue that uh, if you're out of paid work, uh, joblessness is the main contributor to income poverty in Australia and is also one of the major contributors to inequality in Australia. But I think the case for focusing on this is about improving outcomes for people with disability, not because the welfare system is out of control. And finally, how does Australia's disability system compare internationally? Is it, is it uh, well run? Is it particularly strict? Is it particularly expensive? Um, it's absolutely average um, in terms of how much we spend uh, and also it's pretty close to average in terms of the proportion of the population of working age receiving a disability. But the problem with averages is that uh, different countries are really diverse. So some countries um, like Korea and Mexico uh, don't spend very much because they don't have much in the way of welfare systems, but other countries like Denmark and Sweden spend an awful lot, but they also appear to have a, a lot of people receiving disability payments. I think the most noticeable weakness, if you look at OECD studies, is that uh, if you're... If you, receive a dis if you have a disability and you're not in paid employment, then in Australia you have the lowest relative income, that is relative to the rest of the population, of any rich country. Um, and we have the second highest poverty rate of any rich country for people with disability after the United States. And that's mainly, as I said, because people are jobless. Uh, but it's also because more people in Australia with a disability appear to live by themselves or uh, uh, without anybody else in the household in paid work, which is a, which is a slightly different issue. The, um, there was a recent OECD report that came out uh, last year on uh, disability policies throughout uh, the developed world. And it basically argued that uh, the employment services and rehabilitation services in Australia were, were actually high quality. Uh, there'd been a good increase in spending in the last few years on these services, but it seems that there hasn't been enough spent on, on those services. So I think that um, 
if you want to increase the employment of people with a disability, uh, it's focusing on improving those support services where, where I think, which I think is important. Professor Whiteford, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you.